Thank you, Zoom lady. Um, well, everybody, welcome tonight to um, the Linda Loring Nature Foundation Science Pub. This is our eighth year of Science Pub. Um, I am Dr. Sarah Boyce. I'm the Director of Research and Education for the Linda Loring Nature Foundation. Um, if you're not familiar with the Linda Loring Nature Foundation, because of course everyone can be zooming in from anywhere, uh, we're a small land trust on Nantucket Island. Uh, we focus on um, research, education, and stewardship of our 275 acres. We invite you all to come by. Trails are open and free, and there is parking. You have to get to Nantucket first, but there's free parking. Um, <laughs> and um, if you haven't already, um, you can go to llnf.org, our website, where we have all of our different events and talks and workshops that we run. Um, and yeah, so I encourage you to check out that. Um, before we get to tonight's speaker, I did want to mention um, next month, um, our last installment in the Science Pub series for, um, for this year um, is, uh, sorry, I'm looking, it's Monday, May 9th at 5 p.m. Uh, Dr. Gretchen Laboon from the um, Great Sunflower Project um, at and she's part of San Francisco State University, is going to be talking about pollination, conservation, and community science. So that will be next uh, Monday, May 9th, sorry. Um, all right, well, with that, I am super excited tonight to have Rosemary Moscow. I was trying not to fangirl too much because I have loved your comics for so long. Um, as part of my job, I do science communication, and I'm always looking at your comics for inspiration for how to bring um, kind of complicated, sometimes complicated um, natural history information that is also weird and interesting to the public. And I think that you do such a fabulous job of that. Um, Rosemary Moscow is the um, author of Bird and Moon Comics um, and a, amazing science communicator, many graphic novels that include science and nature. Um, and with that, oh, you're gonna, and tonight you're gonna be talking about your newest book, um, which I encourage you to go to your favorite local bookseller to purchase, uh, Pigeons, the World's Most Misunderstood Bird. Oh, thank you, pigeon watching. Um, and so I'm really excited to hear your talk this evening. And so with that, I will say, Rosemary, please take it away. Great, thank you. Do I sound loud enough? I sound it sounds right. good to me. Perfect. If anyone has any um, audio issues, please feel free to type something in the chat. Great. Thank you. I'm not a loud person because I hide in my room and make comics all day. So <laughs> I can be a little quiet. Okay. Let's get this shared. And all right. So hi, everybody. I am so excited to be here. Um, I am from the Northeast and a uh, proud New Englander. And I'm only sad that I can't be in Nantucket right now. So Sarah, I'm um, really excited for, uh, for this invitation. Oh my goodness. And I just clicked right on a bunch of things. Um, so thank you so much. Um, I, I don't know how many pigeons are out near where you are, um, but where I am, there are quite a few. So that's what I'm going to be talking about. So I'm Rosemary Mosco. I'm a cartoonist and a science writer and like Sarah, a science communicator. And uh, yeah, I'm going to be talking about pigeons and how for most of us, they are just kind of a background animal. Now, um, they are an important part of the background. Uh, I found out that for the movie Home Alone 2 Lost in New York, there were about 500 pigeons that were carefully trained to take part in this movie. And only about 200 of them were allowed on set at any given time. So these vitally important actors wouldn't get tired out. So that's something interesting to think about because these are just sort of background birds, but they are super, super, super important and worth investing in in a movie. Um, that is as big budget as something like this or as important to, to many of our childhoods as Home Alone 2. But most of us sort of think of pigeons as, as just kind of there, right? I mean, think about the last time you really thought about pigeons. You're, some of you are probably birders, so you do think about them, but if you do, you might find that they are kind of annoying or they're boring. Or if you keep an eBird list or lists, you might be annoyed that they clutter up your list and you always have to mention rock pigeon. But I'm here to change your mind because if you look really closely at pigeons, you will find that they are completely astonishing. 
So let's stare deep into their beady little orange, yellow, reddish eyes and learn what makes a pigeon tick. Uh, but first we're going to stare into an entirely different set of eyes and that's this sultry pair of eyes right here. So um, see if you can recognize this gentleman and the nerds among you may know that this is Nikola Tesla, the famed inventor engineer um, who lived from 1856 to 1943. And I love this photo of him. I mean, it's just so he's just piercing, piercing you with his eyes while he's probably thinking about, you know, some kind of cool like Tesla coil or something. Um, and, you know, as sultry as he looks, Tesla was a confirmed lifelong bachelor, or was he? Because Tesla did fall in love at one point in his life, and it was with a beautiful white feral pigeon. So here's the story. So for, uh, for some time, Tesla was living in hotel rooms in New York City. He was kind of moving from hotel room to hotel room. And he was feeding pigeons in his hotel rooms kind of out the window. And when he'd notice an ill pigeon, he would capture it and he would nurse it back to health. And that was when he fell in love. He found this one particular white pigeon and he took care of her and he just fell head over heels. And here's an excerpt from his biography um, as told to his biographer, John O'Neill. Uh, and Tesla said, I love that pigeon. Yes, I love that pigeon. I loved her as a man loves a woman and she loved me. When she was ill, I knew and understood. She came to my room and I stayed beside her for days. I nursed her back to health. That pigeon was the joy of my life. If she needed me, nothing else mattered. As long as I had her, there was purpose in my life, which is a lot of affection for pigeons. So my hope with this talk is that you too will fall in love with pigeons, maybe not quite as intensely as Tesla, um, or at least you will fall into some kind of vague interest and it will enrich your bird watching or other science explorations. But first we have to get the basics out of the way. So when I say pigeon, what exactly do I mean? And I've been kind of playing a trick here because I've been talking about one species. So pigeons belong to a scientific family called columbidae, which comes from the Latin word for pigeon or dove. And it's a huge family and it's a remarkable family with tons and tons of really incredible members, including possibly its most famous member, which would be the dodo bird. So the dodo bird has been kind of reclassified as a member of the pigeon and dove family. And you can kind of see it. This is a more modern restoration of the dodo bird. And I'm happy to talk later about the differences between the modern and the older reconstructions, but you can kind of see it. It's walking around on the ground. It's got that kind of like bulbous bill. It looks kind of pigeony got pigeon the eye. But there are some spectacular modern day examples of the pigeon and dove family. And here are two of my favorites on the left, the Nicobar pigeon, and on the right, one of the bleeding heart doves, the Mindanao bleeding heart dove. And the bleeding heart dove is not actually injured. It just has feathers that make it look exactly like it's been shot through the heart and you're to blame. And I think it's, it's just an incredible bird. And they're both beautiful and amazing birds. Um, you may have noticed, though, that I mentioned one pigeon and one dove, and there isn't really a clear distinction in these photos between pigeon and dove. So what is the difference between a pigeon and a dove? Well, uh, when you think about a dove, or when most people think about doves, you, you know, what do you think? You may think of something like this, a beautiful, heavenly, spiritual um, bird here that's descending from the sky. Um, and if you think about pigeons, you may think about um, something a little bit less pleasant, but um, there is, there's a secret here, which is that both of the birds that I just showed you belong to the exact same species. So pigeons and doves are um, basically the same thing. There's no real scientific difference between the two of them. So within the family Columbity, English speaking people basically threw the name dove at some of them and the name pigeon at other ones, regardless of how they're related. So you can't take all the pigeons and all the doves and go, these groups are interrelated. These are, you know, separate, separate little groups. They're not. Um, we just kind of randomly applied these names depending on sort of what we were feeling at the time. And the reason there are these two names for the same bird um, likely date back to the Norman conquest of England in 1066. And I can't totally validate this, but the word pigeon, that's, that's French. 
And the word dove comes from um, Germanic and Norse and, and Old English and all of that good stuff. So the Normans came over, they brought the French, and that's probably why there's two words for the same bird. And what that means is that when Noah released this bird of peace out of the side of his ark, he was really hucking a pigeon out the side to try to get it to bring back some nesting material. So when people say pigeon, um, most of them mean this one particular species, even though there's tons and tons of them. And this is Columba livia, livia coming from a word for bluish gray, but it's also known as the rock dove and the rock pigeon. So you can see it's either a pigeon or a dove. It's also known as the common pigeon, the rat with wings, or hey, you get off my balcony. But for simplicity's sake in this talk, I'm just going to call it the pigeon. Just be aware that there are so many amazing pigeons and doves in this family. And you can't talk about pigeons without talking about people. This is one of my favorite uh, photographs. It's been memed all over the place. This is a statue of Cain. He's not actually sad that there's a pigeon on his head. So the history of pigeons and people uh, are inextricably linked. Like you will, you will come to see how incredibly linked we are. We have been together for a very long time. We have a relationship that has outlasted most relationships. And this relationship stretches back before written history and even before, you know, necessarily um, the human species was where it was at because Neanderthals were eating Columba livia pigeons 67,000 years ago, at least. So there, are, there have been bones found with evidence that Neanderthals were eating them. And given that um, really recent research says that we all probably have a little bit of Neanderthal in us, um, that means that some of our ancestors were eating pigeon. Now, wild pigeons, wild Columba livia pigeons, lived in parts of Europe, Africa, and Asia. And this is a really rough map that I pulled from Wikipedia. It's pretty much impossible to say where Columba livia pigeons used to live um, for reasons that will become clear because we have muddied the water so much on this issue by um, moving pigeons around. So uh, about 12,000 years ago, people in an area of the Middle East called the Fertile Crescent, which you can see on the right there, it's kind of vaguely crescent shaped, started to build permanent settlements and they started to farm the land. And in particular on the left, you can see they started to farm grain. Now, everybody knows that if you drop some bread or hot dog bone on the ground, a pigeon will run over and grab it. And that's because pigeons love to forage for grain on the ground. So this was the perfect recipe. So pigeons love grain. They started to eat the grain that the people were growing and they started to nest in the houses of the people. And then something happened. The people started to think, hey, these birds could be useful. And they tamed them and they built special homes for them and they shaped them by controlling their breeding, which is to say that they domesticated them just like the, the horse or the cow or the the pig or the chicken or the dog or the cat or the goat or any of the other animals that we've domesticated. Okay, wait. So uh, this is when you should imagine a record scratch because why on earth would we domesticate pigeons? Because when you look at a cow, you think, um, you know, depending on who you are, but that animal could provide milk or meat or hide. And you look at a chicken, you think, oh, eggs or meat could come from that animal. Um, a dog is clearly there for guarding, guarding our houses or companionship. And cats are clearly there to mess with us so that we're always on our toes and we never feel quite comfortable inside our own homes. Um, but, uh, oh, I just got a, oops. I just got an, a notification from PowerPoint, but I'm hoping you can all see my screen, correct? Okay, perfect. Okay, that was really strange. I don't know why. I just updated, so <laughs> who knows? Um, it's very important that you see my GIF of this cat knocking something over. So uh, look, look at a pigeon, though, and think, why did we domesticate that animal? Um, well, it turns out the pigeons are really, really useful. They are basically the Swiss army knife of birds if one of those tools was a big old pile of poop. Because one of the reasons to domesticate pigeons is that you can fertilize crops with their poop. Um, it's, it's so, so, so useful if you're in a place like, for example, the desert where the soil is not super, super fertile. Um, you take a bunch of pigeon poop, you put it all over the ground and you can grow melons and cucumbers and all sorts of incredible, um, you know, super moist, super delicious fruits and vegetables. And this poop is also, um, or at least a saltpeter in the poop is a key ingredient in gunpowder. So pigeon poop probably turned the tides of at least some wars and it can be used in leather working. But it's not all about poop because probably the main reason pigeons were domesticated is that you could eat them. 
Um, this is a, an old picture of pigeon pie. And if you have a kind of a, a gross out reaction, but you eat chicken or some other uh, fowl, then you should be aware that um, this is very cultural. So up until relatively recently, just a few decades ago, people in North America were eating tons and tons of pigeon. People in Europe were eating tons of pigeon. And in some places like Egypt and um, other places in the world, people are still eating quite a lot of pigeon. Um, and so we really switched from pigeon to chicken, which I'll talk about in a little bit. And that's really just a start. Pigeons can carry messages. So pigeons have this incredible ability that we don't totally understand to fly back to their homes. So if you carry them really, really far from their nest and then you attach a little um, note to their leg, they will fly faithfully back to that home base and bring your message. You can race pigeons similarly. So you release them really far away and then you put a little RFID tag on their leg and you time how long it takes for them to get back. They can be bred for appearance, behavior, and sound, and so much more. And I wish I had hours to go into all of this, but I don't, unfortunately. But I'm going to share one really cool example, um, which is this. This is a pigeon with a pigeon whistle. It's a taxidermy pigeon. And if we have time at the end, I'm, I'm not going to play it in this talk, but if anyone's curious, I have a video of what pigeon whistles sound like. So this is a tradition in parts of China and in other parts of Asia. And what you do is you take some really lightweight material, like maybe some gourd or some you know, bamboo, incredibly lightweight stuff, and you carve these delicate whistles. And then when the pigeons fly, they're able to uh, fly with these light whistles and they make this sort of eerie, you know, tonal whistling sound. It's really, really incredible. So that's just a longstanding tradition of making pigeons into musical instruments, which is amazing. So uh, back to domestication. So people domesticated pigeons, um, but over time, pigeons became more than just kind of food or poop. They became symbols of peace and hope and love. And think about doves being connected with tons and tons of uh, religious symbolism. There's so many doves in the Bible. There's so many doves in um, all kinds of other religions. And uh, Ramses III, who ruled Egypt from uh, 1186 to 1155 BCE, sacrificed over his lifetime 57,810 pigeons to the god Amon. Um, not all at once, but still, that's an unbelievable amount of pigeons. So how do you get that many pigeons? Well, the answer is that you farm them, but you can't just put pigeons in like a barn. So in the wild, pigeons used to nest in holes and cliffs. And you can see an image here. Um, they like flat surfaces. They'll put a couple twigs on there, but really they're relying on the flat surface to keep their, their chicks um, healthy and from falling off the cliffs. And uh, you can still see this in some populations in Northern Scotland, for example. It is not clear if those populations are still pure, or if they have some mixture from some of the feral birds. So this here is a really old pigeon barn, basically. It does kind of look like uh, an absurd beehive full of <laughs> lots of holes, but this is in Jordan. Um, and these structures are called dovecotes or they have many other, um, many other terms. So this is from 800 to 500 BCE. And it's, it's basically just a cave with holes and the pigeons would go and, and nest in those little holes in these artificial cliffs. Uh, but over time, these dovecotes became amazing. And I adore this photo. Um, so this is a photo of a pigeon tower in Iran. So you're looking down from the bottom of the tower up until the top of it. And Iran um, had some of the, the most incredible pigeon towers, so uh, or dovecotes. Uh, and they really flourished in the 17th century. And you can actually see here, I've circled a couple of pigeons standing on some of these sort of geometric perches. Um, near their little niches. So you can imagine how many pigeons you could have in this structure and how much poop and how many sacrifices you could make. So dovecotes became castles and pigeons became the property of royalty and this ruffled feathers pun fully intended. So think about Ferraris or other items that are basically a class distinction item. Well, pigeons were that. And in a lot of places, um, especially in the UK and in France, you were not allowed to keep pigeons if you were poor. If you tried to, you would be arrested, your dovecote would be knocked down. And if you ever read um, A Tale of Two Cities or were forced to read through all of A Tale of Two Cities, you may remember the scene in which the poor peasant boy is passing away and he's as he's dying, he's 
um, airing all of his grievances with the Marquis um, upon whose land he was living and saying um, in this little quote down here that he was obliged to feed scores of his, the Marquis's tame birds on our wretched crops and forbidden for our lives to keep a single tame bird of our own. Um, and in fact, once the French Revolution came, the poor uh, tore down all the dovecoats of the rich and took their pigeons and were now allowed to keep pigeons of their own. So not only were pigeons high class, but they were also decorated war heroes. And again, that's that messenger pigeon idea. So pigeons were military tech. They've been used in wars forever. Genghis Khan used them. Um, they were used in ancient Rome, but most recently in World War I and World War II, and you can see on the bottom right, those little tiny canisters. So those were affixed to the legs of pigeons. And then soldiers carried pigeons into war. And then when they had a message, they would release the pigeon with this little um, metal canister around its leg, a little note inside, and the pigeon would fly hastily back to base. And a number of pigeons received war medals for their gallantry. You can see it says gallantry here on this pigeon. This is G.I. Joe. G.I. Joe, the pigeon was released to warn, um, warn people that some soldiers had captured a town ahead of schedule. I think it was an Italian town and were worried about getting hit with friendly fire the next day. And so they released this pigeon, pigeon made it home, friendly fire never happened, soldiers were saved. And there was a time that these birds names in World War One and World War II were common knowledge. Everybody knew GI Joe, um, not from the action figure, but from the pigeon. So what was the situation here in North America? Well, uh, rock pigeons were not native to this area, but there was a widespread delicious pigeon species that many indigenous people relied on. And that was the familiar passenger pigeon. This bird was not domesticated because as you can tell from the name passenger, they moved around a lot. So they were migratory. Um, the pigeons in Europe and Asia and Africa, the Columba Livia pigeons were not migratory. So they just kind of hang out all year and you could exploit them all year. Um, and these birds were really important for indigenous peoples, especially the Seneca. We have a lot of um, writing on how important this was for the Seneca and they uh, managed the pigeons in a really careful and thoughtful way. But then of course colonists showed up and they destroyed them. Um, and what a lot of people don't realize is they ate a lot of them. So we ate so much passenger pigeon um, in North America up until they went extinct. But um, just like the, the people in North America, folks in Europe could not imagine a world without pigeons. So they intentionally brought over Columba Livia with them to North America in the early 1600s. You could not live without pigeons. And as with a lot of domestic animals, pigeons went feral. You know, think of feral cats or feral dogs or feral boars or, you know, wild horses or all that stuff. So that is why pigeons are here. Pigeons are here as much as we may hate it because they weren't just considered kind of pretty and nice. They were considered like something that you could not live without. So if pigeons were once so beloved, how did they go from decorated war hero looking incredibly proud to uh, rats of the sky and being considered just these hideous monster animals? Well, a few things happened. And one was that they became obsolete. So pigeons are kind of like the fax machine. They uh, were used for poop for a while, but then we developed chemical fertilizers that you could produce on an industrial scale and we didn't eat pigeon poop anymore. Uh, we used to eat pigeon, um, but then we started eating chicken. And there are a lot of reasons. One is that there was that project to breed these giant um, factory farmable chickens with these huge breasts. And also chickens have a ton of babies at once, pigeons have two, and those babies require something very special when they're being raised, which I'll talk about in a little bit. Um, and war hero pigeons were replaced with, you know, the telegraph or the radio or the internet or any other um, means of communication. But it wasn't just obsolescence, um, things got a whole lot worse. So in 1963 in New York, a couple of people died from meningitis and officials blamed pigeons for those deaths. Um, the pigeons did not in fact give people meningitis, but city officials just thought this has to be the case. And so they declared that they were gonna eradicate 5 million pigeons in the city, which they utterly failed to do. But people were really scared. There was this idea that this pigeon disease would spread up and down the coast and kill tons of people. And then in 1966, um, this is the earliest example of someone saying that pigeons are rats with wings in the press. 
Um, and this was a parks commissioner, Thomas Hoving, and he was basically talking about this, this park, Bryant Park, and how it was full of all these social ills. And pigeons got lumped in with a lot of other perceived social ills, like alcoholic people, people who um, were unhoused, like, you know, trash, all this stuff. Um, so it really, it, it says a lot about the way we think about other people and other animals and, you know, what's desirable and undesirable in our society. And I could go on all day, uh, but they were now rats with wings. And a lot of people really remember this phrase from Woody Allen's movie Stardust Memories in 1980, when he has a character describe pigeons as rat with wings. And that is um, kind of how that really took hold. But you can see this is, this is a recent thing. Like this hatred is really recent. So one of the reasons why pigeon hate is relatively new is that we have forgotten where pigeons came from. And this is maybe my favorite part of the presentation, which is when I get to share with you only some of the wildest purebred pigeons. And to really understand pigeons, you have to understand where they came from and their ancestors. I'm just scratching the surface. Think about dog breeds and cat breeds and horse breeds and all this stuff. Every wild dog breed you can think of, there is an equivalent pigeon. There are so many. So uh, we'll start with the homing pigeons. They are birds that are bred to fly home as quickly as possible to, to get home. They look pretty typical, although sometimes they've got kind of like a beefier wing um, and they can fly 60 plus miles an hour for hundreds of miles um, and you know carry messages. And, and today they're really considered more of a racing bird and, and pigeon racing is like a multi-million, maybe billion dollar industry in, in some places like China. Um, if you find a bird that looks like this, this bird is probably not gonna make it super well in the wild. So be, away, be aware that it might need your, your help and to be rescued. Then there's utility breeds, which is a euphemism if I ever heard one, because what they are utile for is their meat. So these are just big beefy birds. This is a bird that's four times heavier than most pigeons and it was bred for meat. And you can see down here, someone um, patting their lap, American giant runt pigeon. Nobody knows why they're called runts. It's not an intentional pun, um, but yeah, they can make great uh, lap, lap pigeons. And I'm gonna talk about some of the ornamental breeds because they're incredible. So for, oops, for every trait that pigeons have, there is a breed that takes it to the extreme. I, sorry, I was just overwhelmed with enthusiasm for ornamental pigeons. <laughs> so uh, if you like the puffy neck of a pigeon, you may enjoy one of the powder breeds. Not only is this bred to have a huge puffy neck, but um, it's bred to stand so erect that you can see its, its knees at the very top of its legs where they join the chest. Um, if you like pigeon wings and you kind of wish they had more than two, then you might want one of the breeds like the fairy swallow. What's going on here with this breed is that the genes that are expressed in its wings to make it grow wing feathers are being expressed in its legs to make it grow um, wings on its legs. They can't fly with those extra wing feathers though. If you like the shiny bit on a pigeon's neck, which is my favorite part of a pigeon, then you may like my favorite pigeon breed, which is the Archangel. Um, if you look at early, you know, sort of like Mediterranean, uh, Mediterranean, uh, middle age um, paintings of angels, you'll see there, they had really colorful wings, you know, shiny, shiny stuff. There's a whole tradition of angels with colorful wings. And that's what this archangel looks like. They just have that shininess, but spread all over their bodies. If you hate the shiny bit of a pigeon's neck for some reason, and you maybe wish it didn't have any feathers there at all, then you might want to see a Romanian naked neck tumbler for some reason, truly a specialist pigeon breed. So that's just the scratching the surface because fancy pigeons are basically pur purebred dogs. There are curly winged ones like this frill back here that is in my mind, basically indistinguishable from a cute puppy. And if you're more of a cat person, you might be interested in a breed like the Jacobin on the left here, which is designed to look just as aloof and elegant as a fancy kitten. And because of this ancestry, feral pigeons are gorgeous and incredibly cool to look at. On the top left, you can see the, um, the original sort of uh, wild type of the pigeon. It's this kind of gray bird with these two bars on its wings. But on the bottom are some feral pigeons. And the one in the middle is a photo that I took. And then these are two other ones that I pulled from the internet. Um, but they can be red and brown. They can be gray, white. Um, their eye colors for these three birds are different. So the one on the left has what's called a pearly eye. On the right, it has um, what's called a bull eye, where the pigment is gone from the outside of the eye. So it's, you can only see the dark stuff on in the back of the eye. Just incredible. Their beaks are all different colors. They're so neat. And it's not just about color. 
this is um, some cool research by a woman named Elizabeth Carlin, who is a scientist um, who used to study pigeons. And she sent me these photos of cool birds that she's seen that have domestic traits, like on the left, a bird with a fancy crest, and on the right, a bird that's expressing some of those uh, foot feather genes. And wing patterns also vary. And this is maybe one of my all time favorite facts about pigeons. This is so cool. So here is a photo of kind of a, a typical flock of pigeons. And I've pointed to three birds here, all of which have that wild type wing pattern. That's just kind of like a smooth pale gray with two dark stripes. But let's look at some other birds here. So you can see these three birds that I've pointed to. Their wing pattern is almost entirely dark with a few little kind of speckles of light, or you could see it even as just light with a few little speckles of dark. So what's going on in there is that at some point in the history of pigeon domestication, people blended a bird called the African speckled pigeon, which is a, a, another species, Columba guinea, with Columba livia. Uh, we don't know why, it must have been something about improving the breed. You can see those little speckles on that bird's wings and the genes from that bird are why we have so many birds that have these speckled genes. Um, and the speckled wing is actually a dominant trait. Um, there's a couple varieties of it. It's just so cool to me that you can see this imprint on pigeons, you know, in our, in our cities. We don't know why this cross was made. So when you start watching pigeons and noticing those colors and patterns, you're going to start seeing something else, which is weird behaviors. So let's take a look at some of them. So first off, pigeon sounds. These are just a couple of the really cool sounds that pigeons make. So I heard that um, the sound is kind of having some issues here, um, but I'm going to try playing the sound for you and hopefully it'll work. And if not, I'm going to just as a backup, I'm going to make the sound for you. So I apologize in advance. So take a listen to this sound here. So this sound here is the display coo, and it sounds like and it is, <laughs> that took me a while to practice. <laughs> um, and it is a really cool sound. So this is a sound that male pigeons make when they're doing that sort of walking around spinning thing. Um, they're bowing and cooing to attract a female and female pigeons will also do that later too as kind of a pair bonding thing. And that's kind of the traditional pigeon trilling coo, but there's another coo that you will sometimes hear. And this is a really weird one. So the first time I heard this, I thought there was a guy outside my apartment making a weird noise. So this is called the advertising coup. So I'm gonna play it and then I'm gonna um, do it for you too. So that one doesn't have a trill and what it sounds like is so that is a, a coup that a male pigeon makes when he's found a cool place to nest and he wants to call over a female and say, hey, let's make a nest here. So he stands up on this cool spot and he coos. And it really just sounds like a person going woo. And then later um, female pigeons will make that too as kind of a bonding thing. So be aware that there are two different kinds of coos. One of my favorite facts about pigeons is that uh, we were taught a lie in Sesame Street. So we all know that pigeons bob their heads back and forth when they walk, right? Just like um, Bert doing this pigeon dance. Well, he is absolutely incorrect. They do not, in fact, bob their heads back and forth when they walk. So what pigeons are doing is when we walk, we kind of keep our eyes like a few steps ahead, maybe three steps ahead. So we make sure we don't step on anything. And we're not even really aware that we're doing it. But pigeons have a really long, flexible neck with twice as many vertebrae in their neck as we have. So they will shoot their head forward, look around, and then bring their body back up to the head, and then they'll shoot their head forward to do some recon again, and then they'll bring their body forward. And to illustrate this, I've got a video. Um, thank you, person on YouTube who took a slow motion video of a pigeon walking. So it's a little hard to see, but you can see it shoots its head forward, and then the body catches up and then it shoots its head forward again. So there isn't really a point where it's pulling its head way back because there wouldn't really be a reason for it to pull its head back. Um, so really this is kind of a way of it to explore its world, which I think is, is really cool. Pigeons uh, mate for life. 
and they are remarkably faithful. There's a lot of birds that mate for life, but pigeons will actually stay pretty faithful to each other um, most of the time. They will find another if a member of the pair passes away, which unfortunately happens a lot in feral um, environments, but they really are just super, super, super lovey-dovey birds that will display for each other and kiss. And one of the reasons why they have such a strong pair bond is that most both males and females care for the young and both males and females feed their young milk, which is one of the reasons why it's hard to raise pigeons en masse like chickens because baby pigeons for the first few days require milk in order to develop. And the male and female pigeons produce this milk in an area of their esophagus called the crop. It has all kinds of traits similar to mammalian milk. It is stimulated by the hormone prolactin. It has fats, it has proteins, it has kind of antioxidant, antibacterial properties, and it evolved convergently, which means that uh, mammals and pigeons stumbled across this milk idea independently, which I think is really amazing. It's kind of chunkier, you don't wanna drink it, uh, but that's sort of true of a lot of mammalian milk too. One question that I get a lot is, are pigeons invasive? And I think that's a really good question. And the answer is probably not, although there are situations in which they can cause a lot of problems. And there are some situations in which they could potentially spread diseases to native species. Um, I really like what Chicago Audubon has to say. They say, because they are so closely tied to human activity, they have not had a major ecosystem impact and they have not displaced any native species. They have adopted us as we have adopted them. So although there are lots of pigeons in cities, towns and farms, their overall environmental impact is slight. So basically we bred them to be our best friends. So they hang out with us and they don't really go into forests or anywhere else. So I think pigeons are interesting to watch, but if I haven't convinced you, then maybe my little friend here can convince you because pigeons are prey for all kinds of really cool birds, including hard to find raptors. Um, so many different birds eat pigeons. And uh, if you see a flock of pigeons burst into the air, chances are that's because there's an aerial predator. So keep an eye out for falcons. Um, look for hawks, especially red-tailed hawks. Look for accipiters, um, especially the Cooper's hawk. Um, there are all kinds of different birds, though, that will eat pigeons, everything from owls to gulls to uh, red kites. It's, it's really, really cool. So there's a lot to enjoy about pigeons and lately people are showing a bit of a renewed love for them. And there's been kind of a minor pigeon renaissance and that makes me really happy. One of the reasons is that as more and more of us live in cities, pigeons have become a symbol of our urbanity. And I think this is a really good example. The New York Board of Elections has taken on the pigeon as their mascot. So here they have early voting and they're symbolizing it with a pigeon that has been converted into a rooster. Um, and that's them kind of reclaiming their urban, their urbanity. And we also just really love underdogs. And sometimes pigeon struggles are just really, really relatable. And we can all, you know, look at them when we're commuting to work and think, yeah, I kind of feel like that pigeon. There's also a growing movement to keep rescued pigeons as pets. And you can do this because pigeons are not covered under the Migratory Bird Treaty Act. Maybe don't go grab a pigeon from a park. There are lots of pigeons that need to be rescued from local rescues, from um, SPCAs and, and so on and so forth. Um, what about pooping in the house though, you may have wondered. And there is an answer and it's delightful because that's where pigeon pants come in. So pigeon pants are basically pigeon diapers. They're also known as flippers and all kinds of other great puns. And this pigeon here is, you can see it's got that kind of black bit down near the bottom, which is collecting the poop. And then it's got this kind of harnessy bit and you can decorate your pigeon in all kinds of ways and make it really look like it's ready for the rat race or ready to you know, get married. Um, you can coordinate with the seasons. It's really terrific. So to be a little serious for a moment, I really think pigeons are powerful because they connect us with our world. And I don't think that you can fully love nature without understanding the history and context that led to it being the way it is. And I think that's what pigeons can give to us among other maybe less savory gifts. So thank you so much. Um, feel free to help me with questions. And uh, my book is a Pocket Guide to Pigeon Watching, Getting to Know the World's Most Misunderstood Bird. It is currently in um, a nightmare of uh, 
of um, supply chain stuff. So you can really only get it on Amazon or Barnes and Nobles. It will be in stores again, I promise. Um, but Amazon is unfortunately where, where it's at right now. So thank you. Thank you so much, Rosemary. I can't tell you how many times I laughed so hard. Zoom was like, you're <laughs> muted. <laughs> Yay. Um, so thank you so much. Um, we do have lots of questions and comments that have come in. Um, just so everyone knows, like if you want to ask Rosemary any questions, I'm going to be kind of curating the questions. Feel free to put them either in the chat or the actual Q&A. Um, and I will get to reading. Um, and then for those of you that are on Nantucket, um, I did want to make sure everyone knew, I reached out to our local booksellers. Uh, Mitchell's Book Corner and Bookworks are owned by the same um, people and they did also try to order like a few months ago and they had the same issues so but they did say if you are interested you can go into the store and order you know pre order if you want to go through um, our local booksellers. Um, I just wanted to give that plug the local plug too. Yeah, they, they so and I see Sarah McLaren is replying here too. Um, I think you may have emailed me. I'm not sure. Um, and I am so sorry. So in Canada, this was a nightmare. I got on, I'm from Canada. I love Canada. I got on the CBC to talk about pigeons. And the books had been out of stock there from since November, which is basically when the book came out. And I have been calling and calling and calling and fighting and they are coming. It's going to be a couple more weeks. And I'm just it's, it's it um, uh, don't release a book during the pandemic it's been an absolute nightmare to deal with that so it's been really, really hard but maybe the, the so like sorry. flip side is your book is in demand it's like the it's the hot ticket <laughs> yeah yeah I guess so but it, it was yeah it was pretty pretty early that a shipment kind of just disappeared so I I have done all I can my publishers are doing all they can it's literally just like boats are not moving um, but yeah, now they are moving. So I am so sorry. And they are coming and yeah, Amazon, the dreaded Amazon has them. Um, also if you genuinely can't get one, drop me an email and I've got some comps so I can mail them off. If you have tried so hard and failed, I can, I can help you complete your mission. Thank you. All right. I'm my scrolling through the, oh, I'm clicking on the wrong thing. I'm like trying to scroll through the chat. Okay, so um, I'm gonna jump around with questions if you don't mind. Um, so one person asks, um, could you elaborate on Dr. McCarthy's work on documenting pigeon and duck hybrids? Pigeon and duck hybrids? I have never heard of that. There so is know. some knowledge. Okay, so Skylar, if you have more information, I'm interested, wow. but okay. Moving yeah, I've on. never heard of that. Please let me know. That seems, yeah, I love bird Island hybrids. Of Dr. Moreau. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I think that, I don't know about that. I don't know about that one. Oh, there's um, a crazy guy on Twitter who claims ducks less pigeons are a thing. Let me add him. Cause I don't think, um, I don't think he knows what he's talking about. <laughs> Thanks Skylar. I, is that like, is that like a jackalope Skylar? I'm curious. Um, so lots of thank yous. Okay. So i um, truly enjoyed this entertaining and illuminating program. Um, you might comment on the movement to rename pigeon species, i.e. Uh, rock dove is now rock pigeon based on rounded versus pointed tails, but common names are not as important as scientific ones. Yeah, it's a mess. Um, I know that um, the American Ornithological Union, which had its name changed, was it the AU? Anyway, I'm sorry, I'm blanking on it, but they, they used to call it uh, rock dove for a really, really, really long time. And then rock dove was changed to rock pigeon fairly recently. And then there was a movement to change it back to bring kind of more decorum to the, the, the rock pigeon, because we have this connotation with doves as being nicer and that utterly failed. So there has been a lot of back and forth, a lot of argument. Um, I think common names are so messy and everything, you know, from botany, everything's got a million common names. So honestly, call them whatever you want um, there. I have a list of international names in my book. You know, people have all sorts of names for them. Maybe not rat with wings, but you can call them anything. <laughs> um, so Leslie says, I heard that pigeons are one of the only birds who can drink or swallow water with their heads down instead of sipping and tilting their head back. Why did this evolve? You know, I don't know why that is. And I'm also really curious. So um, 
unlike, so when songbirds drink and, and parrots and lots of other birds, they dip their lower bill in the water and then they throw their head back and they let the water trickle down their throat. But pigeons are able to create suction um, inside their mouths and inside their throats so they can actually slurp water up, which is incredible to me. Um, so they're basically living straws and it's great. They don't have to throw their heads back. I don't know why. I would love to know if anybody knows why exactly that happened, but I wasn't able to find out. Um, but I think it's incredibly cool that they can do that. And I have a drawing in my book of a pigeon next to a little, a little drinky straw. Very interesting. Yeah. So um, should folks with balconies try to set up possible nesting spots for ferals, especially to try and swap fertilized eggs with fakes? Interesting. Oh, yeah. Um, I don't think so. if you're trying to reduce the population of pigeons, there's really kind of only one thing you can do, which is um, feed pigeons less. So the number one reason why there are more and more ferals is um, it's, it's really food. It's not really how many predators there are or so on. Um, so I think if you're trying to reduce the number of pigeons, um, I don't know that that will help. And also your balcony will get really, really, really gross. And they reuse nests year after year and they poop and they um, build right on top of that disgusting mass of nest every year. And so um, don't do that to your balcony. That sounds, that sounds really unpleasant. If you want them, go for it. Uh, but I have tips in my book for how to get them off your balcony. So, so I, I would not, maybe not do that. Um, Penny Snow is mentioning um, a, a Nantucket favorite. So she says she laughs every time she goes down to the steamship terminal uh, where most of our Nantucket pigeons hang out, unlike the mainland cities where they're downtown on government buildings. So that like, next time and you, we invite you to come to Nantucket, you'll see as you come on the boat, the whole steamship terminal building, that is where all the pigeons are. That's where we would have taken uh. you to be like, come see the pigeons. <laughs> they Oh, that's so, that's such a cool anecdote. I want, I mean, I also see pigeons under bridges all the time. Mm -hmm. I feel like they love any industrial setting where there's a flat surface for them to, to lay their eggs. Um, that's really, really cool. That's a cool observation. Um, there's lots of, there, you're getting lots of love in the chat in general and thanking you for your talk. Um, one person says, not a question, but a hello from Dublin, Ireland. I love your cartoons and pigeon books. So thank you for a fantastic talk. That's a a general um, sentiment. I'm glad you got a copy of the book in Dublin. That makes me really happy. Some of them are out there. <laughs> um, here's another question. If they often mate for life, why do some males still try to hump uninterested females? Like when they're literally busy eating. eating? Okay. Okay. Yeah. So sometimes you'll see males that have not paired up yet and are kind of an enthusiastic young bird, or maybe they've lost their partner and they will literally try to like knock a male off of a female while they're mating. Um, but most of the time when you see a male displaying and a female looking bored, they're already an established pair. Um, and the male is just kind of trying to keep the love alive and also trying to keep her from being um, accosted by other males. So they'll also do a thing where they um, call driving, where the males will chase the females away um, and basically chase them until in some cases they've chased her all the way back to the nest. And that's when she's getting undue male attention. So, uh, a lot of it is less sinister than you think, but I mean, even though I talk about them being really sweet, I don't think we should put our ethics on them or vice versa. Um, cause they will definitely be a pain in the butt to each other for sure. Um, okay, so this is a question, um, thanking you for the talk, but then also the question as about the head bob, and they apologize in case that they missed this part. Are their eyeballs fixed, or does it have to do with the fact that they can't move, like can't, is it, does it have to do with the fact that they can't move their eyes? Oh, yeah, you know, that's like a really good part. question. Um, no, I mean, I think it's, these are all really good questions. I think what's going on for pigeons is that it's just easier because of their incredibly flexible neck. So they have 14 vertebrae in their, in their neck instead of seven. Um, it just makes more sense. I mean, they don't have as much ability to move their eyes, um, but it makes more sense for them to stick their head out as sort of like a little probe and kind of look around um, and then bring their body forward. And they've also got a wider field of vision because they've got the eyes on the sides of their heads. So I think it's just another way to, to do it. Um, and then, um, Maybe opposite from the balcony question, there's a question about um, Melissa who loves having the doves pigeons in her yard. 
Um, they love the bird bath, but they don't seem to like the bird feeders. Is there anything that she can do to make them happier in the yard? Oh, yeah. Um, I mean, I think you probably don't need to worry about feeding feral pigeons because they've usually got a pretty big um, food source elsewhere. And if they're around, that means they're able to find some food. But they will eat um, food that's on the ground. They, I've, I've definitely seen them especially morning doves flying up to bird feeders and knocking everything out. And it's a huge pain. Uh, but for the most part, especially the, the feral pigeons are ground feeders. And I mentioned in the book that the kinds of things they like, which is stuff like legumes. Um, they really like like peas and, and, and grains and that kind of stuff. Um, so, I mean, I've seen people put out lentils for pigeons, like that's, that's a possibility, but really just having that bath there is such a good source because pigeons love to bathe and they're really fastidious bathers in water. And they often bathe in like puddles, you know, that have oil in them and stuff, and that can contribute to them looking kind of gross. So I think it's really sweet to give them a little water to, to clean themselves up and, and improve their quality of life. Um, are there other birds that also feed their young milk? Is that unique to pigeons? There are, yeah. I can never remember the full list. I think, uh, so I know flamingos do and it's blood red and it's really creepy. Um, I think some penguins do, but I, I can never remember all of the ones that, that feed their babies milk. So yeah, there are definitely some non pigeons that have also figured it out. Um, look up pictures of flamingos doing it. Cause it's, it's, it just looks like they've, they've killed and eaten another flamingo. There's all this like creepy blood. It's pretty fun. Um, there were, this is interesting to me. Cause I'm going back through the chat. Um, both our executive director, Kitty Potchman, and then Susan Richards, who works for the animal shelter here. Um, the cats and the dogs really enjoyed your particular, um, cooing when you were mimicking the <laughs> awesome. I, it, the audio ended up being really good but I didn't want to tell okay. you that I like I like <laughs> your also your vocalizations <laughs> um uh, there's questions about how social they are like they seem like really social birds are they you know did you have any comments on how social they are um as a species yeah, it's kind of complicated. Um, I know from rescuers that they say that um, they really are pretty social. And so if you adopt a pet pigeon, you should either give it a lot of attention or um, give it another bird to hang out with. But they're not as socially complex as say like a, a chimpanzee or something. So um, they don't really have a lot of friendships in their flocks and they will, um, you know, sometimes they'll hang out with a flock for roosting and then they'll go hang out with another flock for feeding. Um, really it's the pair bond that's the most important to them, but they feel more comfortable being in a flock because if a predator shows up, then they can, you know, have more eyes in the sky and that kind of thing. Um, so I think it's complicated. I think, uh, some pigeons are more loners and some are more flock birds, um, but they're probably not, you know, throwing a birthday party for this one bird and everybody knows who likes everyone and who doesn't like everyone. Like, I don't think it's quite as complicated as that. But yeah. Um, so Seth, who um, works for the Linda Lauren Nature Foundation and leads our bird walks, he says, okay, you talk, your talk convinced us of why we should appreciate pigeons, but what do you, um, how do we generate the same energy for a native species? Most people don't seem to have a huge, be huge fans of morning doves either. Um, there was another question about morning doves as well, if those were also considered pigeons. Yeah, that's funny. I mean, I don't feel like, so I think I'm interested in the hate against pigeons for a couple of reasons. One is because it's so recent and the other one is because it really has to do with a lot of forgetting um, of why species are here. So I sort of think that its lessons may be more applicable for birds like the turkey, um, which is, or the Canada goose, both of which are in huge numbers here because they are conservation success stories and they're native species that are doing really, really well. Um, and so now we hate them because they're in our space. So I think that they have lessons for us in terms of, you know, just forgetting that context. But I'm really sad to hear that about morning doves. I mean, I feel like most people I talk to really like morning doves, but maybe some people don't because they think that they're the same as pigeons. Um, I mean, I think they're, I think they're really wonderful, but yeah, I mean, I, I don't know. I maybe just, it would be helpful to explain explain to people the differences between the two birds because morning doves are urban success stories too. They're amazing. Yeah, they have beautiful calls too. Um, 
there's a, a, a fan comment of you do a beautiful job of illuminating us on a family of birds often mis misunderstood and love your style. I definitely um, agree. Um, I've heard, so uh, someone says, I've heard pigeons can recognize faces um, and that they are one of the few animals who pass the mirror test. Can you um, comment on that? Yeah, uh, it is amazing. There is a whole rabbit hole you can go down on just studies of, of pigeon intelligence, especially in the lab, because they were lab birds for a long time. I mean, B.F. Skinner was doing a lot of work with pigeons. He taught them to play ping pong. Um, there have been some really, really wacky studies. Um, and, uh, and yeah, it's, um, it's, it's, so they can definitely recognize themselves in the mirror. They can also, um, distinguish between slides that have cancer versus not cancer in a medical setting, like human cancer. Um, they can distinguish, um, there was a study that showed them, I think Indian dance and martial arts, and they could tell the difference between those two. Um, they could tell the difference between um, Monet's and Picasso's, although they couldn't tell if a Picasso was hung correctly the right way. They could they couldn't tell if up or down was the right way to hang a Picasso, which like same to be honest. <laughs> um, but there's I have a list of them in my book. There's so many wild studies, and it's interesting because they're very smart, but they're also not you know as smart as say a, a raven or a crow. Um, it's all really complicated. But if you uh, swap pigeon babies with another pigeon's babies, they pigeons can't tell. So there are limits to their, their understanding too. Uh, but yeah, they're definitely smarter than we think they are. So that's, thanks for bringing that up. That's a good point. I have so many questions about those studies. I need to <laughs> re read that part of your book. It's like, wait, what? Um, so there's a question um, from a reporter who's based in Phoenix that's working on a story about pigeons. Ooh. Um there's a lot of questions specific to Arizona. So I don't know if maybe Hunter, if you could give your contact information, I might pass that on to Rosemary. Yeah, you, you're easy. welcome to email me here. I'll put my email in the chat. Okay, great. Um, I don't know, I'm not, I'm Northeast based. So I don't know that much about Arizona and pigeons in each area. So we've discovered there's a lot, um, there's a lot of isolation between different pigeon populations so that they're, they can be really different depending on where you are. So I, I might not be able to answer your questions, but I'm happy to help out as much as I can. Great. Um, do you have any thoughts on passenger pigeon de-extinction? Oh, um, <laughs> gosh, that's so complicated. I feel like that's something I would want to leave to the experts. I think, um, I think I would be more interested in making sure that people understand the story of the passenger pigeon before we de-extinct them, because I feel like I was told a lie as a kid. So what I was told as a kid was passenger pigeons were numerous, but then they all died. RIP, it was sad, people did it. Aren't people terrible? Which is like very simplistic and also ignores the fact that a lot of it was that certain colonists had this idea that, you know, well, why were indigenous people not eating all of them? Why manage sustainably when you can make a ton of money? And so they, you know, overexploited them and they all disappeared. So the idea that people are bad for passenger pigeons, I think is incorrect. That people were managing them really well. And then other people who were not managing them so well. So I think like it's it's a complicated start. I mean, I didn't realize people were eating them. I thought we were just chopping down trees and, you know doing a Lorax thing. Like it's, I think it's, it, it has so much to say about power and colonialism and history and, and indigenous rights and so much stuff. And I think, I, I guess first I want everybody to, to get that. And then we can talk about um, bringing back this, this species. Cause otherwise that stuff's going to keep happening, I think. But I would love to see one. I mean, I want to, I want a pet passenger pigeon. They seem really cool. I want a pigeon with like a flute on its back. I think that's, pretty interesting. <laughs> yeah. Do you want to see the video of, of pigeons? Um, I, I, you know, if you have time, if you're, if you're okay with yeah. it, I would love to see one. I have a few, I have a few questions myself, but I really oh. want to, see, I want to see the flute pigeon. <laughs> okay. Okay. I'll try to, I'll share. Let's see. So I'm gonna go to this video. So, so you said the sound is working, so hopefully it's going to yeah. work. I'll just play a little bit of it. Do you hear kind of an eerie whistling? Yeah. 
have to wait for it. So that's that's um, what pigeon whistles sound like, and it's just one of the coolest things that I've. So learned would about. that flock have each had one, or was it like one in that flock that had one? They each have them. Um, yeah, yeah, and there are. I mean, there's there's whole like museum exhibits just of Chinese pigeon whistles, Indonesian pigeon whistles. I mean, they're they're just they're so they're so incredibly ornate, and they're all different. Um, and so you can get really different tones. It's, it's just incredible. It's yeah. It does sound a little eerie sometimes. I think right? it's. Um, so I had a question. I mean, I have loved, um, learning about pigeons and, you know, I think, um, one of my things as a science communi communicator is like helping people love the unloved species. And that's why I love, I always share your turkey vulture, <laughs> um, comics. And I'm wondering if, um, for you, what's what's next? Is there another book on the horizon? Is there another species you want to explore? Or what are some of your favorite um, species that you like to explore? I'm actually, so I have some other books coming out. I need to, Pigeons was like a huge effort. Like I love, loved working on it. I had fact checkers. I talked to a zillion scientists. It was much bigger than anything I've done. And so I need to come up with something else, but I'm still kind of in that days of, you know, I put out a book. <laughs> And it was a lot. Um, I really want to do books about um, Canada geese or or urban turkeys or um, house sparrows are another interesting one because house sparrows were brought over because people thought, or at least my understanding is because Europeans were like, well, we got to make this place more European. So let's bring over these birds to make a nice sound. Like we literally have the song sparrow here. Like it's just like unbelievable. <laughs> so um, there's just so much interesting history that I feel like we're missing. Uh, but I don't have any plans for anything like that right now. I feel like pigeons just had more cachet than a lot of those. So it's a harder, it's harder to twist publishers arms on, you know, a turkey or something. <laughs> Well, I, I appreciate the, the unloved species that get the, get the extra shout out. Um, a few people had a question after that video of whether or not the pigeons themselves could hear the whistle and if it affected their behavior at all. Yeah, I mean, I'm sure they do. Um, I don't know if it affects their behavior. So um, when you think about, so those were, those were domesticated pigeons and China has an incredibly long history of um, breeding fancy pigeons. So those were birds that have been wearing pigeon whistles, you know, in, in some shape or another for potentially hundreds, thousands of years. So um, I would think more about like, you know, uh, a rescue dog pulling someone out of an ambulance or an avalanche or, you know, something, something like a poodle with its, with its funny, um, with its funny, you know, haircuts or something. It's similar to that. It's like these birds are here to sort of like, we're bred for this purpose. Um, so, you know, I don't think it's harming them or anything like, like that, but you get into all kinds of thorny issues as you do with any fancy breed. I mean, there are pigeon breeds that have beaks that are so short that they can't really feed themselves. Um, there are pigeons that can't see because there's there's feathers in their eyes, just like dogs that, you know, have tiny eyes or hair in their eyes. It's, it gets really complicated whenever you talk about any, animal breeding stuff. Yes. All right. So we're just after six. I'm going to look back. I think we have lots of thank you comments and a new appreciation for pigeons, I will say. Um, and yeah, if there's any other questions right now, feel free to type in, or if I missed your question, um, cause it was back further in the chat. Feel free to type something up again. I think I kind of went through, but, um, I want to find out about those pigeon duck hybrids. Cause that is just the wildest thing. I know I, I, ha I happen to know Skylar, so I'm going to ask, <laughs> um, oh, the, so the, um, Ken Blackshaw, um, famous Nantucket birder also just said that he was happy to see that the book is available through our Athenaeum, which is our historic local library oh that's nice okay that's good i'm glad that it's there excellent yeah. um do other bird species use their wings to slap each other or enemies like pigeons do i don't know i heard that swans do that too um but i'm not really sure i didn't do a deep dive in other 
in other species, I think swans do it. So for folks who don't know, we, pigeons, um, when they're feeling really defensive, especially if something comes near their nest, they will make a growl and they'll also hit, hit you with their wings. They'll do like a slap, which I think is really cute because it's just so benign. I mean, one of the reasons we domesticated them is they can't really hurt you that much. So <laughs> they'll just kind of give you a wing slap. It's, it's very cute. But yeah, please, please mention in the chat if you know other species that do that, because I'd be curious. Um, um, Sarah, thank you for staying strong. I'm sorry that your book is still not, oh, that breaks my heart. As a Canadian, that's killing me, killing me. I'm going to try to go back on CBC, hopefully when the books arrive, but I may be a million years old at that point, but no, no, I'm, I've been told it's, it's a couple of weeks. They're coming. All right. Well, there's another, you know, another whole holiday season of pigeon book gifting. So there you go. Um, well, unless there's any more questions right now, I feel like Rosemary, this has been so fun. I learned so much. I laughed a lot. And then I feel like that's, you know, learning anytime we can learn something new and laugh at the same time. Um, I think that you learn more. I don't know. I always make when I give nature walks, I, I make up silly songs and sound really silly. And sometimes I worry, you know, that it like discredits your science knowledge. But I think it just makes people remember what you said. Yeah, well, we all know. I mean, sedges have ed edges and rushes around and like all that stuff that that's those yeah. are memorable tools. So I want to go on a nature hike with you and hear you singing those songs that's okay great. you're gonna we're you're gonna come with me and we'll do some um bird calls and we're gonna have <laughs> some silly plant songs it'll be great we'll invite the crowd out so <laughs> that, oh that sounds like heaven um well rosemary this was a huge treat for me i'm so glad um that you came here tonight and um we will definitely have you come out to nantucket sometime and hopefully the the book will be available in canada by then I hope so. Yeah. And thank you so much for having me come to chat. These were some of the most fun questions. I really appreciate it. Sometimes I get, you know, ew, pigeons, why? But these were like really <laughs> thoughtful and, and excellent. So I appreciated it. They were great. And thanks everyone for being here tonight. And um, just a reminder, um, we're going to be posting the recording either later this week or um, sometime early next week. I'll email it around to everyone that registered and you can, um, it'll be freely available on the Linda Loring Nature Foundation website. So you can um, share it around to, um, to get all, everybody to have the same love for pigeons that, that we just shared here tonight. So <laughs> thanks again, everybody. Thanks everybody. Bye. Bye.